Hello there, I'm Jackson from Cointelegraph, and with me today I have the co-founder of Tezos, Arthur Brightman. How are you doing today, Arthur? I'm good, thanks for having me. So, the first thing I want to ask you is, uh, can you just say in your own words what exactly Tezos is? I always think it's interesting coming from the creator, how, how you formulate it. Yes, so uh, Tezos is a blockchain. It's a smart contract platform, and also it powers a cryptocurrency called Tez. So it's uh, you know, in, in, in religious parlance, you would say it's a uh, layer one uh, protocol. I like that, nice and simple. Um, so what's what's going on in Tezos? What are you developing right now? Uh, there's a lot going on. We've had a tremendous year of growth, uh, especially in the uh, NFT space, and art NFT space has been really, really booming. Now we're seeing uh, a lot of new growth coming in the DeFi space and in the gaming space. Uh, like the things that I work on is I try to bring projects to, uh, to the chain. I try to talk to uh, entrepreneurs, developers, and creators who are looking to work on Tezos. But I also talk to um, development teams, core development teams, because Tezos is a self-evolving uh, protocol, which means that it has uh, uh, rules uh, on the blockchain to decide what the next version of it is going to be. So people may be familiar with Ethereum and you know, saying like, oh, we're going to get Ethereum 2.0. So uh, we've had nine upgrades on the, on the Tezos chain. So talking to the developers who are working on those upgrades, and that's many teams working on that, is also part of what I do. So you named a couple sectors earlier there, DeFi, gaming. Are there any particular um, spaces in the Tezos blockchain that you're really, or you know, in blockchain in general that you're really excited about, like sectors of the industry? Uh, gaming, uh, I would mm. say that's uh, that's a very exciting uh, uh, that's a very exciting sector, and it's you know it, it's something we've been passionate about for a long time. You know, I uh, uh, we, I started involving in, getting involved in some gaming projects on Tezos in 2018, uh, before gaming and NFT was a big thing. Uh, but I would say now, I would, largely speaking, people are starting to realize that gaming is very important. Another area I'm quite excited about that people haven't really tapped into um, is DeFi for real world assets. We've seen DeFi for DeFi assets, which is interesting as a uh, as a lab and as an experiment. But I would say to unlock the real power of DeFi, it will have to be used for actual financial applications, real world assets being tokenized. So the, the combination of those two words, the meaning of uh, uh, traditional securitization and DeFi is going to be uh, uh, quite big, I think. When you say real world assets, I mean, are you talking about like stocks? Are you talking about like cars? Like what yeah, do you mean absolutely. By that? No, I, I, I am. So it could be uh, it could be stocks. It could be uh, 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 digital arts. Um, I, I consider that a real. I consider that a real asset. Um, uh, stocks, digital art, real estate, uh, anything you can think of. So, are, you, are we talking about NFTs here then? Yeah, absolutely. A financialization of NFT is going to be a big thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny because whenever I hear about like the the stocks thing, I always think about synthetics. You, you know, you know synthetics, yeah, right? Of course, of course. And it. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but to me, it seems like it hasn't really become too popular, even even among, among the tradfi community. Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of things. One is that right now we have a high tide. There's a lot of excitement and, you know, you're either out of the crypto space, in which case you're not going to look at it, or you're in crypto space and there's just so many opportunities, so many things going on that it doesn't feel that those applications are very, very compelling at the moment when, you know, you have a yield farm where you're going to get like 500%. Uh, if, 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 if you're a finance person and you're looking at this space, this is what you're looking at, right? Now, I would say the tide is going to go out at some point because, you know, these things are not sustainable uh, and what will remain are real use cases. And that at that point, I, I think we'll see more interest in these. Got it. So, like, what, what's, that, what's that catalyst then to get people in? Um, the, 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 the catalyst I say is, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, some, of the, uh, some of the hype dying down a little bit, actually. Okay. Got to let the dust settle. Figure out what's good. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I think we've had you know, tremendous hype over the year 2021, which you know, brings a lot of money into the space. So it helps build a lot of things. But you have to, you know, it's kind of like bulking up and cutting down at some point. You have to confirm that to uh, what actually has a, a point. And the point of DeFi cannot just be to trade DeFi tokens. <laughs> but but, but right now, this is what it is, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm laughing because that's what it is right now. <laughs> um, so, okay, you have Tezos, you have Ethereum, you have uh, Cosmos, you have Polkadot, you have all of these layer ones. How, what does the resolution of this layer one landscape look like? I mean, consolidation definitely is going to uh, uh, is going to happen. Network effects are possible because, uh, as we've seen, bridges are very difficult uh, between chains. Uh, we keep seeing bridges um, getting hacked. There's natural reasons for, for this to happen. Blockchains are not very good at porting state from one to uh, to another. Even in ecosystem like Cosmos, you make some um, you, you have to weaken your security assumptions as soon as you have a bridge. So I would say that that is going to um, leave. Uh, verticals um, for different for, for different ones. So I think network effect can be built around there 
uh, verticals in the in, in those spaces, but lots of consolidation. Mm -hmm. So, are we talking zero sum game, two or three blockchains? Like, what, what do well, you? Well, no, it's, it's not a zero sum game because uh, you know, the, the universe of what can be done is uh, is still expanding. And like I said, right now it's very very incestuous, almost. You know, the the, the type of trading that happens on these blockchains. There's a gigantic untapped universe that's out there. So I think everyone has a lot of room to grow uh, mm -hmm. at this point. But I've still, I would say after a growth phase and there will be some consolidation. I don't know if it's two or three, like, you know, I'm gonna give the, uh, the, 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 the safe centrist answer, which is gonna be a power law. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, the exponent of the power law is just going to keep increasing. I, 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 I like the idea of, you know, having niches. For blockchains like specific use cases what do you think about that like solana for gaming or you know carving out a specific sector of the industry for for that blockchain to inhabit yeah i think it's possible uh one thing we have to be careful about is that a lot of some a lot of time people think that blockchains are going to specialized from a technical standpoint for mm -hmm. those niches i think like oh your blockchain will be designed specifically for that use case i don't think that's going to be really the case i think we're going to see a lot of convergence in the design of uh, uh of blockchains um we're kind of circling patterns of you know what works in terms of uh of scaling and what doesn't so we'll have a lot of convergence but what's make uh, i think a niche sticky is simply just a network effect of um the composability between the contracts and just people being there so you think we're kind of just like waiting around to until someone finds the best solution and then we kind of like iterate on that I, th I think we're getting there. Mm -hmm. So that kind of brings us to the trilemma, right? Decentralization, scalability, and security. How, how is Tezos, like, what, what, where do you stand like, in, in all three of those? I mean, for a while we stood back because I was looking at the scale, uh, I, I was looking at the solution that were available, um, the way that uh, Ethereum wanted to do sharding in 2017. I, I didn't see anything that was convincing. Um, my own approach that I published in 2017 for doing scaling was um, using zero knowledge proof for scalability. So that's now known as uh, DK rollups. It's what you see, for example, with companies like uh, Starkware and Starknet or um, uh, Aztec or Meta Labs. So these have become extremely popular at scaling solutions. Mm -hmm. um, Interestingly, I do think that the, the best path now for scaling is a combination of uh, similar technology called optimistic rollup mm -hmm. and that availability sampling. So that combination, I think, is a, uh, uh, is a winning one, is w and, and it's what we're going to start seeing uh, being deployed. I don't, I don't really buy the very, very big, very, very fat um, layer one, uh, uh, high, high throughput layer one approach that Solana is doing. I think having a modular approach is going to win. Mm -hmm. So... I think a lot of what you just said might have gone over whoever's launching this head. Do you think you could like dumb it down a little bit and explain okay. what? So I think, yeah. for, so the first thing is I think we can solve the trilemma, right? I don't mm -hmm. think it's uh, an inescapable fact. I think you can have something that scales, that's really decentralized and that's really safe. Mm -hmm. So that's the great news. Uh, that's the great news about it. So the way I think about it is that when you think of a validator on a blockchain, they're really doing three different jobs. One is that they're taking all the transactions and then saying in which order this transaction should happen. And that sounds very, very trivial, you know, who, who cares about the order? But it's actually a subtle problem and that's, you know, that's what at the heart of solving the double spend problem, right? It's mm -hmm. like you want to have an ordering. And that's where consensus comes from, all of that. The second thing they do is they take all these transaction and they execute them, they compute the results. And the third thing that they do is that they tell everyone what transactions have happened so that I know if someone is, pay, is, is paying me, you know, whether or not so the payment is, uh, is valid. The approach to scaling and solving the trilemma involves unbundling those three activities. Mm -hmm. You basically take your validators and you say, you're just going to order transactions. That's all you're going to do. And we're going to rely on different solutions for making those transactions available. And we're going to rely on different solutions for executing them. The way ZK rollups work is that you outsource this to uh, an another party. It could even be a single party. Someone who's going to collect all the transactions that have been posted. They're going to compute the results. They're going to post the results. And they're going to post a cryptographic proof that the result is correct. That's the magic. So they post a very small proof. It's got 100 bytes. You spend two milliseconds on it. And you're like, yep, yep. You know, you've done this calculation for five hours. You've checked everything. And I am convinced it's correct. That's the magic. It's very, very magical. There's a big downside, which is computing this proof is really, really expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a lot of computing power. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of overhead. The optimistic rollup is a very similar approach, but instead of posting a proof, you just post some. Uh, you just post a bond and you say, "Look, I believe this is a result." And if anyone disagrees, they can, they can, they can, they can prove it very, uh, very easily. So instead of proving that you're right, you wait until someone proves that you're wrong. Um, so that's a, it's a very s slightly different security properties, but you don't have to have this giant overhead of computing these proofs. 
Interesting. Uh, thanks. Thanks for giving that definition. I appreciate it. Um, any final words you'd like to say to Coin Telegraph viewers? Yeah, uh, check out Tezos because you know we've been around for a while, and uh, last year has been a year of tremendous growth for the uh, uh, for the project. We've had a lot of really cool uh, applications launching on a chain. Uh, check them out, and uh, also check out our roadmap for scaling because I think we have one of the best roadmap for scaling out there, and uh, we're executing very very quickly on it. Thank you so much. That was Arthur Brightman from Tezos, and I'm Jackson. Thank I hope you. you enjoyed this interview.